We left off in the middle of our discussion of Jonathan Edwards, and we had just finished reading from some of his most famous sermon, the most famous sermon that he ever preached, which was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So famous, in fact, that it is included in pretty much every public high school American literature textbook. In 11th grade, as a junior in high school, most American students read excerpts from Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Preached by Jonathan Edwards in 1741, preached in his own pulpit in Northampton, Massachusetts, and then preached again a few weeks later when he was doing some itinerant preaching in Enfield, Connecticut. And it was there where uh, he got the really passionate, emotional response that we all associate with the preaching of that sermon. A couple things that we made mention of last time that I think are worth repeating I think it's worth noting that Jonathan Edwards did not always preach on God's judgment, God's wrath, eternal condemnation, and hell. While it is important that we not shy away from what the Bible teaches about that doctrine, it's also important that we teach all of the other things that the scriptures speak of. And it's a little unfair to Edwards' reputation that this is the only sermon that anyone ever remembers that he preached. He preached on heaven more than he preached on hell. He preached on a lot of other biblical topics. And um, I think I may have told you on Tuesday, this is one of the advantages, I believe, of expository preaching, is you allow the text of Scripture to determine the topics, and that way you avoid getting on one hobby horse topic all the time, and you also avoid neglecting topics that you need to address because you're allowing the scriptures themselves to dictate what topics are going to be included in your preaching schedule. So I know that being here at TMS, you're going to get a lot of plugs for expository preaching, but here's another one. It keeps you from just hitting the same thing all the time and becoming sort of a a one-trick pony in your preaching. Jonathan Edwards certainly was not that, even though perhaps his reputation is such. I think the way that most high school juniors perceive Jonathan Edwards is as a fire and brimstone, unhappy, kind of angry Puritan, and nothing could be further from the truth. Edwards is the one who gives us that great doctrine and emphasis on the joy and delight and wonder of serving God and glorifying Him. And of course, we talked about how John Piper in our own day has kind of brought those truths to us in, the, you know, in his kind of famous motto of God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. That is a very Eds, Ed, Edwardsian, if I can get the words out, Edwardsian uh, way of thinking about theology and thinking about life. And so uh, that also brings up another point, just this is a tangent, but I'll interrupt myself to mention it. Piper has, I think, he has done the contemporary church a great service by bringing Jonathan Edwards' theology back to us and making it accessible to us. He also serves as an example for us in this regard He has made a historical hero kind of one of his spiritual mentors. And I would encourage you to do that as well in your future ministry. As you go through this class and as you think through some of the men whom we study, if there's one that you discover who you feel like you particularly resonate with, make that person sort of a historical mentor to you, who even though that person is now in heaven, Through their writings, they can continue to disciple you and shape your ministry. I know Mark Dever also talks about this as being an important thing in his own life. And so I would just encourage you to kind of be on the lookout as even in doing your project and other things. If you come across someone and you say, you know, I really really would like to know more about that person. Uh, Just, I realize you're in the midst of seminary. You don't have time to do any outside reading and study at this point in your life. But Put that away on a back burner and revisit it when you get into full-time ministry. uh, An opportunity to not only appreciate the biographies of many individuals, but to allow some of them to shape and influence your own ministries in profound ways. Piper's an example of that, and Edwards is the one who is his historical hero. We read a little bit about sinners in the hands of an angry God. 
And again, just to paint the context here for the First Great Awakening, 1739 to 1741, parallel movement, of course, the evangelical revival that was happening in England, Edwards is preaching to a congregation in which people know the Bible, grew up going to church, and yet we have a largely nominal Christianity, an apathetic, lethargic form of Christianity, an externalism and a legalism that had come to largely characterize Puritan New England in the early to mid-18th century. And in the same way that Anglican Old England had largely been influenced by Enlightenment ideas and Christianity had had grown more or less externalistic, moralistic, apathetic, lethargic. It needed a revival, and that's where the Wesleys and Whitfield fit into the picture. Similar things had happened in Puritan New England. The halfway covenant that we talked about last time was an example of that, where Solomon Stoddard, Edward's grandfather, recognized that there were unsaved people in his church and he allowed them to be members of the church simply because he was trying to evangelize them through that process. Edwards' preaching of sermons like this were particularly effective for reaching an audience that knew the truth but was living as if that truth didn't matter. And what Edwards is doing is he's reminding people of the eternal implications of their apathy and their lethargy and their indifference towards the truth of the gospel. He's preaching to congregations that are full of tares, and we're seeing among the tares that God is converting some of those whose, hard, whose hearts had been hardened simply by familiarity with gospel truth, but truth that had never penetrated their consciences. So, sinners in the hands of an angry God, we read part of that sermon very, very familiar, uh, very powerful, and uh, perhaps a reminder to us today that it is important for us to preach about these things, to preach about the eternal implications of rejecting Christ. We live in a day and age where these kinds of sermons would be incredibly unpopular. We would be viewed as judgmental and harsh and unloving. And I think it's helpful for us to remember that that, that attitude is a product of our postmodern tolerant culture. It is not a product of a biblical worldview. History helps us have perspective even on the time in which we live. All right, so let's talk a little bit then, picking up, and I, I know we've already looked at this slide, but just picking up here, let's talk a little bit more about what was happening during the Great Awakening. And of course, awakening refers to a spiritual awakening. This is a revival, and a revival in which individuals are being awakened to the truth of the gospel. They're being convicted of their sin, and they're repenting and turning and trusting in Christ for salvation. Because Edwards' preaching and Whitfield's preaching and some of the others, uh, Gilbert Tennant and others who were involved in the Great Awakening, because their preaching is resulting in emotional responses on the parts of their audience, it is met with a certain level of resistance from conservative Congregationalist and Presbyterian pastors there in New England. So we have these old school Congregationalists, old light Presbyterians, who are opposing what's happening in the Great Awakening simply because they don't like the emotional response that this kind of preaching is producing in some of these congregations. This forces Jonathan Edwards to defend the Great Awakening. And I, I remember we talked about this just at the end of class on Tuesday, but to reiterate a little bit because it's important, Edwards, later in 1741, after he preaches that great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, goes back to his alma mater, Yale, and he gives a lecture on what he determines to be the distinguishing marks of a true work of the Holy Spirit. These he derives out of 1 John chapter 4, where the Apostle John writes how you need to test the spirits, 
because not every spirit comes from God. There is a spirit that does, and there is a spirit that, of course, is the spirit of Antichrist. And the Apostle John gives some principles there, which Jonathan Edwards then mined out of that text and said, how is it that we can determine a true revival, a true work of the Spirit of God, from a false revival, something that is nothing more than an emotional reaction to things? And you'll remember, because we talked about it just briefly, 1 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that there is a sorrow that is a worldly sorrow that never produces any change, and then there is a genuine sorrow that leads to repentance. And Edwards picks up on that idea, and he says, look, emotional responses are no proof of true revival one way or the other. So they don't mean that the revival is false just because people start crying or get upset emotionally. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's a false revival, certainly, but it also doesn't mean that it's necessarily a true revival. You have to wait and see whether or not repentance follows the emotions, because repentance is the true mark of revival, not emotions. That's Edward's point. He's defending this against those who are accusing the revival of being essentially a fraud simply because there's emotional responses that are present. Sometimes these emotional responses could be kind of extreme. We have people crying out in the middle of church services. We have people fainting because the weight of conviction is so great that they're actually fainting and falling down. Now, over time, some of these spiritual, emotional responses, especially in the second Great Awakening, which we're going to get to, they begin to be mimicked and imitated and faked. And uh, in the Second Great Awakening, falling down starts to become viewed as this kind of spiritually, um, uh, this more spiritual response to the preaching of things. And eventually this gives rise to being slain in the Spirit and some of the things that we see in the Pentecostal movement today. In the First Great Awakening, though, these are legitimate emotional responses to preaching, at least for the most part. Edwards acknowledges that there can be excesses, there can be times when these things are faked, but for the most part it's legitimate, but legitimate or not, the emotional response doesn't prove or disprove the veracity or validity of the revival. You have to look at the fruit of a person's life. And so he, he ends up writing a treatise, that lecture becomes a treatise called The Distinguishing Marks of a True Work of the Spirit. And he has some of these marks that, you know, it must point to Christ, it must emphasize and elevate truth. Uh, but ultimately, if you're going to boil it all down, Edwards is looking at the fruit of a person's life. So the profession of faith and the emotions that even accompany that profession are ultimately in vain if there is no fruit to back up the profession. Very much a James 2, lordship salvation way of viewing conversion. True conversion is a transformation. Transformation produces evidence of transformation, what the Bible calls fruit. Fruits of repentance, fruit of the Spirit. And if there is no fruit, it gives us reason to question whether the conversion that is professed ever actually took place. So Edwards then begins to preach on what he calls the religious affections. And this is what he is emphasizing in this idea of religious affections. That the, the will and desires and then subsequent behavior of a person who is truly converted is going to look distinctly different than someone who claims to be converted but really isn't. And so I think we, we did get to this slide on Tuesday, but here he says, Christian practice is the sign of signs in the sense that it is the great evidence which confirms and crowns all other signs of godliness. And remember that the idea of godliness in a Puritan vocabulary is not just spiritual maturity. That's how we usually think of godliness. It is, in fact, conversion. So you have people who are godly, that means they're saved, and people who are ungodly, which means they're unconverted. And here he is saying that the sure sign of godliness or conversions is that your life has been transformed. He's not teaching salvation by works by any means. What he is saying instead is that good works are the evidence of 
salvation, which of course is by faith through, or through faith by grace, uh, by trusting in the work of Christ on the cross. All right, so he goes on, there is no one grace of the Spirit of God, but that Christian practice is the most proper evidence of the truth of it. Practice is the proper proof of true and saving knowledge of God as appears by that of the apostle already mentioned. This is the apostle John. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. It is in vain for us to profess that we know God if in works we deny him. And if we know God but glorify him not as God, our knowledge will only condemn and not save us. The great note of that knowledge which saves and makes happy is that it is practical. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. To depart from evil is understanding. Goes on. Holy practice is the proper evidence of repentance. Repentance, of course, is the changing of your heart, your mind, your will. That is a gift of God. 2 Timothy 2.25 It is a miraculous uh, aspect of regeneration that you are transformed from the inside out. The fruits of repentance then are seen in a changed life. So holy practice is the proper evidence of repentance. When the Jews professed repentance, when they came confessing their sins to John, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, he directed them to the right way of getting and exhibiting proper evidences of the truth of their repentance when he said to them, bring forth fruits that are in keeping with repentance. I'm updating that a little bit which was agreeable to the practice of the Apostle Paul. Pardon and mercy are constantly promised to him who has this evidence of true repentance, the fruit that he forsakes his sin. Proverbs 28, Isaiah 4, Holy practice is the proper evidence of a saving faith. Practice is the proper evidence of the life and soul of true faith by which it is distinguished from a dead faith. And, uh, you know, in a day and age when uh, I suppose it's, it's largely, uh, I think it's still with us in practice, though perhaps it's been muted in more recent years. But in a day and age where there is this idea of the, the no lordship gospel, the free grace gospel, as long as you just make a profession of faith, then you're saved and it doesn't matter how you live your life after that. Uh, Zane Hodges, who... Uh, is no longer alive. Zane Hodges was one of the prominent advocates of that view. Hodges even told a story, and I would need to go back and find the exact reference, but he told a story of a colleague who he used to work with, who I think was a, a fellow teacher in a Bible college setting or something like that. And this colleague ended up denying Christ, turning away from the faith, going and teaching at another school and actively promoting atheism and decrying biblical Christianity at every opportunity he got in his teaching. Hodges concludes from that, you would think that I would say that that person's not saved, but, Hodges says, because he truly believed at one point in his life, he will be saved in spite of his apostasy. Um, it, and the way that Hodges actually explains it, Maybe I'll look it up and find it for you guys. But the way that Hodges actually explains it, it is that blatant. He, I'm not saying anything more blatantly than he would put it. That's the essence of the non-lordship gospel. And of course, Dr. MacArthur wrote his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, in response to that kind of thinking. It's just important, and I think this is a good place to say it, it's important for you men to understand that historically, throughout Every generation of the church, all the way up even to the present, excluding the free grace camp, historically, sola fide has always been within the, con within the construct of lordship salvation. So you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It is always accompanied by subsequent fruit, which is seen in a changed life. So I just want to make the note in our discussion of church history that when you trace the history of salvation by grace through the early church fathers, through the reformers, through 
men like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, the other great preachers of the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, they all emphasize that good works must be the fruit of a truly transformed life. They emphasize what Paul emphasizes in Romans 6, 1. Just because we're saved by grace, does that mean that we should sin, that grace may abound? May it never be. All right, question. If you want that quote, it's, uh, he has lost his faith, but Christ has not lost him. Yeah. Yeah, you can find it pretty easily online, that story about, um, about that co-worker of Zane Hodges. He has lost his faith, but Christ has not lost him. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Where would you um, place Charles Ryrie in his position in all this? I think I would say that, I mean, Ryrie takes sort of a, what he attempts to see as a mediating position between the two, um, where <coughs> he more or less defines repentance as simply a change of thinking. And I think Scripture defines repentance as a transformation of your entire person. So I know the word metanoia literally means a, a changing of your mind, but it really is more of a change of direction. And so I don't think that Ryrie fully gives the word repentance its, its due biblical um, emphasis and weight. I, and I, you know, with all due respect to Charles Ryrie, I, I, I think he was perhaps trying to find a position in which he could still hold to repentance and still be on the same faculty as Zane Hodges. And as so often happens, those who try and find the middle road end up finding a road that's not really the best one. Yep, Cameron. Um, I've got uh, Dr. MacArthur's article I mean, concerning Ryrie. I was just reading just a few days ago his quote. And, uh, I won't read the quote, but Ryrie uses the argument that the word repent doesn't appear in the Gospel of John, which is just, I, I just can't believe an argument that's stupid. Quite frankly, I mean, the, the word grace doesn't appear in the Gospel of John either, so maybe we shouldn't preach that either. Yeah, it's a reductionist. It's a reductionist argument that ultimately is so reductionist that it ends up leaving out essential components of the gospel message. He's a heavyweight theologian, and you just don't expect an argument that lame. <laughs> you know, there's 65 other books, and John wrote his. Um, his uh, letters, three letters, in Revelation, calling the churches to repent in Revelation. And even in uh, John 3, where it says at the end, he who believes will be saved, he who does not obey. So the opposite of believing is disobedience. I mean, the concept of repentance is there. I just am amazed that anyone would even try to argue that. Yeah, and the reality is that repentance, the theological concept, concept is all over the Gospel of John. When you look at John 8, where Jesus talks about uh, the, uh, who a true disciple is, and he talks about uh, love for him as being a distinguishing mark of his disciples, and then you go f forward to John 14 and 15, John 15, 14, actually, John 15, 14, where Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, that is that is repentance. Repentance is a changing of all of who you are from serving yourself to serving and loving God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that will manifest itself in obedience. Also, he wrote first John where he says, who are the children of God? Who are the oh, children absolutely. Of the devil? I mean... <laughs> I just, uh, I just encountered some people using this argument. Yeah. Yep. Um, just wanted to get your thoughts. One of the main arguments against Lordship salvation is not necessarily that it's not biblical, but that it has legalistic tendencies. How can we as pastors both preach a 
lordship salvation consistent with scripture but also uh, not uh, burden the people with with a sort of legalistic tendency that unless you're really serving the Lord you're not saved <coughs> yeah I, you know I think we I appreciate that question because I I think it's a, a a legitimate question that has pastoral implications for how we shepherd our people. Um, we recognize that sanctification is a progressive process, and I, you know, I would take people to Romans chapter seven, and because I do believe that that is a reference to the Christian struggle with sin, this side of heaven, and I would encourage them with the fact that even the fact that they are struggling to fight against sin, sometimes failing, but that in and of itself is evidence of a regenerated heart. Because an unregenerate heart doesn't fight against sin. So, um, I think lordship salvation is a biblical concept. You know, if you confess Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And, and of course, a host of other passages. And I would emphasize that repentance is not a work, it is a grace. 2 Timothy 2.25, it is a gift from God, just like faith is, Ephesians 2.8. And we would emphasize, of course, that you are saved by the work of Christ, His righteousness imputed on your behalf. And so I want to exempt, I want to um, elevate and emphasize grace, but I also want to emphasize the fact that Christianity is about an entirely new self-identity, that we are slaves of Christ, He is our Lord and Master, and that changes everything about who we are. So I would want to be gracious, I would want to be kind, I would certainly want to avoid legalism, legalism I would see in the most proper definition of that term as trying to earn God's favor through my own righteousness and my own good works. And I would emphasize to people that no, our righteous standing before God is based solely on the work of Christ. And yet, now that we have been adopted into his family, he has given us, by transforming us, the ability to walk in the power of his spirit and be led by his spirit. And... Um, much like Jonathan Edwards did, I would want to emphasize the joy of salvation and the joy of walking in righteousness. Because there is great delight. Our greatest delight comes from honoring and pursuing Christ with all of who we are. So, you know, those are some of the things that I would hope to emphasize because you're right, I, I don't want to fall into the trap of making people somehow think that... Um, think in legalistic ways. I, I do think that we have to be careful. All right, good discussion, but uh, maybe a little bit of a rabbit trail. Uh, but it's just Edward's sermon brought that up, and I just, I just want to encourage you in recognizing that, you know, when Martin Luther, and uh, I've got quotes in the syllabus for you from it, but Luther, sola fide, but he says, of course, good works follow. John Calvin, sola fide, but of course, good works follow. And if we were to go back to the church fathers, Augustine and Chrysostom and others who teach salvation by grace through faith, but of course, of course, a changed life is the inevitable consequence. All right, yeah, we'll, we'll go a little bit longer on this. It's pizza lunch today, so why not? <laughs> Cameron. Um, is it, is, would you say, what you're just saying there, would you say that's, that's a real hole in the doings book? is that the doing is hammering away at the reformers like their free graces when they're not? Yeah, I suppose. What specific... Are you thinking of a specific yeah, he's, comment he's, in his book? The doing is really going after him on the issue that they're basically saying they've, they've done their sacraments, they're in, and some of these people are living like complete pagans and there's, there's, there's no good things <coughs> in their life. And... Um, he, he's really he's really after that. And as I was reading one, I thought, but but these guys actually they taught that you know that um, that repentance is a fruit of conversion. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it was um, a wrong criticism of their theology, but I I just picked it up in his book. That's all. Sort of
Yeah, well, um, certainly an attack that is sometimes presented against those, especially those who champion the sovereignty of God in salvation, is that this reformed soteriology could perhaps lead to a form of antinomianism. Because, hey, if, if once saved, always saved, if the perseverance of the saints, which really perseverance of the saints means those who are saved will persevere to the end. But if, if, you, um, if you take that point of reformed soteriology, that there are some who would accuse those who hold that view of opening the door to antinomianism. And actually, even today, there is quite a bit of discussion going on in the conservative, young, restless, reformed movement about are we neglecting an emphasis on sanctification by being so utterly focused in our emphasis on justification. So Kevin DeYoung writes The Whole in Our Holiness. And uh, you've got... um, Why did I blank on his name? The guy at Compass Bible Church. Thank you. Yes, Mike Fabares writing long series of journal articles in response to Tullian Chavidian's stuff on um, kind of a modern let go and let God kind of soteriology. So this stuff is still going on today, um, right now. Um, it's, an, it's an important issue. All right, there was one other hand. Yep. Uh, would it be accurate to say that uh, like Ryrie and Hodge's position was more like if, if you just ascend intellectually to like, the death and resurrection of Christ for the name of your sins, like that's all you need that searching for money, <coughs> and not a real full trust in that as like a saving faith more just like Yeah, I think I think Hodge's view was essentially as long as you really uh, as long as you made a profession and you meant it when you made it. As long as you did that at some point in time, then however you live after that point doesn't really matter. And he actually taught that the weeping and gnashing of teeth passages in the New Testament don't refer to hell. They refer to people in heaven who lost their reward by living such bad lives after they were converted. And, uh, and it's the loss of reward that causes that weeping and then in the eternal state, Christ will wipe away every tear from their eyes and they'll be fully restored to essentially a, an, an enjoyable eternity. Um, that is, yeah, that is clearly not a historical way of understanding those passages. Uh, Ryrie seems to have been kind of a half step closer in, in saying that there actually was some permanent change that took place but more of a mental change than a change of will, a change of desires, a change of affections, a change of heart. Because we would see repentance as a change of life, not just a census. It's more than that. It's, it's a change of life. Yep, Nick. Yeah, sorry. Um, just conversations I've had back home, there are a lot of non worship salvation churches, and they would say that um, making Jesus your Lord is a work. So that would be faith plus work. Um, so would you basically have to go through Scripture well, and just kind of define repentance as... I think I would respond by saying, does making Jesus your Savior count as a work? I would say trusting your Savior is an act of your believing faith. See, and I would say Jesus is Savior whether I make him Savior or not. He is the Savior. And he is Lord whether I make him Lord or not. So I'm not making him anything. He already is Savior and Lord. I am in faith embracing who he is. And I cannot embrace him truly without embracing him as Lord because he is Lord. Yeah. It, it, the distinction is just so hard. I don't mean to keep, keep bringing on no, this. No, I mean... But it's, they, they kept emphasizing to me that by faith you can accept him as Savior. By faith you can accept him as Lord. That's not the issue in so much as surrendering is the work. And so that's a faith plus work act. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I mean, I would respond, I guess, by... <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting. I, <clears throat> I wrote a, an article on the Pulpit Magazine blog a while back called, Can You Be a Christian and Not Love Jesus? 
That was the title of the article. And I came to the conclusion, using nothing but the Gospel of John intentionally, I came to the conclusion that no, no, you can't be a Christian truly and not love Jesus. Right? That seems pretty, I think that seems pretty basic. That to me is like Christianity 101. And the diatribe and deluge of angry, defensive comments from non-lordship people was absolutely astounding to me, where people were saying, of course you can be a Christian and not love Jesus. I'm thinking, what? What kind of Christianity is this? Um, So that's where I would take it, is I would say, look, the gospel is about Jesus Christ. It's about embracing Jesus Christ for all of who he is. It's about falling in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is only possible if God has changed my heart, which is what repentance is. Repentance is not a work. The fruits of repentance are the works. Repentance is the change of heart, which only God can do. So when I, when my heart is changed and I suddenly have love for Christ that was not there and would not be possible in my unregenerate state. My response then is to give evidence of that love in how I live. And, and what does love for Christ look like? Well, he himself said, if you love me, you will do what I say. So <clears throat> this whole idea of this is a work, whatever else, no, the works are the fruit of it. The change of heart is a work of God, not something that is a work of man. So that would be my response. All right, back to the Great Awakening. <laughs> this is good. This is good stuff. I mean, this is. Uh... But no, look, listen. If church history isn't practical, then church history is not worth studying. And when we talk about guys like Edwards and others, when we study a little bit of their theology, I want you to see that it is relevant to understand what it was that they taught for the things that are still being talked about today. I mean, the the big issues haven't really changed very much in the last 2,000 years. And it always makes me laugh, even going back to first semester, when people talk about the modern contextualization debate as if it's something new in church history. And we go all the way back to the second century with Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian, and they were having the contextualization debate back then. So I, I get excited about this stuff. I'll stop. All right, in the mid-1740s, Edwards meets and is very impressed, really impacted and influenced by a man named David Brainerd, who had lived with the Edwards family for several months. Brainerd was a missionary to the Native American Indians there on the frontiers of Massachusetts. He died in 1747. He was only 29 years old. And Edwards published his diary, his memoirs, in 1749, just two years later. Now, we're going to talk about this more when we get to the modern missions movement. Uh, but it's, it's actually really, really cool, and I've traced some of this that we'll talk about when we get there. But <clears throat> Brainerd is regarded by many as the grandfather of the modern missions movement. And by the way, if you're looking for somebody in church history who you kind of want to uh, get to know a little bit better, David Brainerd would be one who would be very much worth your time. He will inspire your prayer life through his diaries. He's only 29 years old when he dies, and yet his passion for evangelism to the Native American Indians and his diary inspires Jonathan Edwards so that Edwards eventually becomes a missionary to the Housatonic Indians of Massachusetts himself. That diary makes it across the Atlantic to England where it falls into the hands providentially of a man named, uh, actually a shoe cobbler, named William Carey, who reads it and is so inspired that Carey decides he's going to become a missionary to the India Indians. And William Carey is regarded as the father of modern missions. And actually, you can trace the influence of one missionary to the next, and I've done it for 10, all the way from David Brainerd down to uh, Jim Elliott. 
and it's it's really really powerful. But uh, some cool things are are happening here, and Brainerd Short Life <coughs> helps to spark then the modern missions movement. And this is a uh, an out. Brainerd, of course, is living and working and ministering during the First Great Awakening. The modern missions movement becomes an outgrowth of the Second Great Awakening and something that we'll talk about as we get into 19th century Christianity. Uh, so there's uh, Brainerd preaching. All right, well, we've talked about the Halfway Covenant a few times as we've talked about Jonathan Edwards in terms of the context of his ministry this finally comes to a head. Remember, the halfway covenant is the idea that we have people who are baby baptized into a covenantal community in Puritan New England who we want to keep as part of the visible church. Uh, again, this is where our dispensational believer's baptism helps us because we don't have all of these problems and contingencies. But in any case, these people are part of the visible church, but they've never been converted. And Solomon Stoddard and some other older ministers decide the best way to reach these people is to keep them in the church. The only way to do that is to actually compromise on the membership standards for church membership. And so we have a bunch of non-believers who are made members of the church and allowed to participate in communion, even though they're not actually converted. Jonathan Edwards comes to the conclusion that this is not a good thing. And uh, in much the same way that you remember Calvin made that dramatic stand where he fences the Lord's table when the Libertines wanted to let an excommunicated, church-disciplined guy participate in communion, Edwards decides that he's going to take a stand and he's no longer willing to serve communion to those who have... Sure, been baptized as babies, but never really been converted. The result is that after 20 years, more than 20 years of being the pastor of this church in Northampton, he is voted out of his church, and this would have been the voting members, which would have been the male congregants in the church, so it's a pretty big church, but he's voted out of his church by a count of 200 against him to 23 for him staying. Another lesson from church history. We talked about it with Calvin. We'll talk about it with Edwards. We may mention it when we briefly talk about Spurgeon, but some of the best known names in church history went to churches where the people in their own lifetimes did not appreciate them and treated them very badly in certain instances. And so when you get to your church and suddenly people in your church don't like you and are making your life difficult, I don't know if it'll help much, but you can at least take some solace in the fact that some of the greatest names in church history experienced similar turmoil and difficulty. As a result of this, after being a faithful pastor there in Northampton, Massachusetts for over 20 years, Edwards, having been inspired by David Brainerd, decides that he too is going to go and be involved in missions work to the Housatonic Indians there on the frontiers of Massachusetts. Remember, we're in colonial America, and the frontier, pretty much every, <laughs> every 50 years or so that we're studying now in American history, the frontier is moving farther and farther west. At this point, the frontier is very much on the eastern part of the United States, on the western side of the colonies. And so by still living in Massachusetts, but in western Massachusetts, he's right there on the frontiers. He's still continuing to do scholarly work, though. Even here, in 1754, he publishes his well-known work on the freedom of the will. That, by the way, is the same title that we have with Erasmus's book called The Freedom on the Will. Uh, at least that's the way that those two titles have been popularly remembered in church history. It's important to emphasize that they reached completely opposite conclusions. So Erasmus's freedom of the will is essentially Arminianism before Arminius. Edwards' freedom of the will is very much Luther's bondage of the will, but taken from a different perspective, which is that God has freedom of the will, 
And that man's freedom of the will is a compatible freedom, which is dependent on God's absolute freedom. In February of 1757, Edwards accepted the call to become the president of a new college in New Jersey. The Great Awakening, as we mentioned, had created a rift among the Congregationalists and Presbyterians in New England with regard to those who were skeptical and opposed to the revival efforts and those who were very much supporters of the revival efforts. And uh, when it became clear that schools like Yale and Harvard were going to side with those who were more skeptical, the New Light Presbyterians, those who were promoters of the Great Awakening, they decided that it was time to start a new school that represented their Great Awakening evangelistic perspective. And so they started the school that eventually becomes known as Princeton University. It is, it is very interesting when we study church history in America and even in Europe that all of these universities start as Christian universities. And Princeton was a little bit broader than just a seminary, but it also trained men for ministry in addition to training people for other avenues uh, and career paths in life, a distinctly Christian university. George Whitfield was one of the early supporters of what would become Princeton. Jonathan Edwards is one of the early presidents. He's not the first president, but he's one of the early presidents of what today would be a bastion of anything but evangelical conservative Christianity. Edwards' tenure as president of, we'll call it Princeton, even though it wasn't called Princeton at the time, was very, very short uh, because... He actually, when he traveled there, uh, due to smallpox outbreaks and concerns, he was inoculated for smallpox. But at a time when medical technology was not what it is today, the inoculation actually gave him the disease, and he died being infected with smallpox from the smallpox inoculation. So he's born in 1703, and he dies in 1757. He was only 53 years old. He would have turned 54 later that year. He's only 53 years old when he dies. And that's another interesting lesson from church history is the amazing output that some of these men had, even though they died at, honestly, relatively young ages, at least from a contemporary perspective perspective. All right, I'm going to read this Yale introduction to the freedom of the will. It's a lot of small print, but I, I want to read it to you because I want you to know about this work. It's considered one of Jonathan Edwards' most important works. Remember for Edwards, the sovereignty of God, when he was a young man and a teenager, the sovereignty of God had been an obstacle to his belief. And then in his conversion, he had come out the other side, seeing the sovereignty of God no longer as an impediment to belief, but really as the fountainhead of all theology. And here in his treatise on the freedom of the will, we have really an explanation of how it is that this is the fountainhead of his theology. So here's the Yale introduction. The freedom of the will. Listed as one of the 500 most important books in American history, and here's the actual title, a careful and strict inquiry into the modern prevailing notions uh, of that freedom of the will, which is supposed to be essential to moral agency, virtue and vice, reward and punishment, praise and blame. So that's very Puritan. The Puritans had a way of taking short things and making them long. They, they were able to compact short summations into very long books. The freedom of the will is one of Edwards' most enduring performances. In this monumental work, Edwards is at pains to combat the prevailing notions, advanced primarily by Arminians, that the will is self-determined in the sense that our choices are not predetermined by any other cause but the exercise of will itself or exercise from a state of indifference. In other words, 
Arminians taught that human beings, especially in response to the gospel, that they have essentially independent free will. The ability to choose whatever they want to choose without any other sort of factors being involved in persuading them one way or the other. For Edwards, this was nonsensical and dangerous because it denied the sovereignty of God as first cause. Famously, Edwards reduced such a view of the will to an absurdity by using the infinite regress argument. Causes of a supposedly indifferent choice were actually linked as in a chain, stretching back infinitely. So there is no true independence when it comes to the use of our free will. That's his point. In its place, Edwards offered a compatibilist view of the will and moral agency based on inclination that attempted to reconcile freedom and necessity. A person acted according to predisposition, either towards sin if unregenerate, or holiness if regenerate. So in other words, you make decisions based on your desires, really is what he's saying. And if you're unregenerate, in keeping with Luther's bondage of the will, then you're bound to sinful desires. You will always choose sin because you want to choose sin. And it takes a work of God interfering in that. A monergistic act of God in which he takes the initiative to change your desires so that you can respond to the gospel. Choice was a matter of strongest motives. Humans have a moral inability to resist their strongest motives. According to one spiritual state, then, there was a necessity to choices and actions that at the same time did not violate freedom and liberty to make those choices and perform those actions. So in other words, you, you always do what you want to do. And until God makes you want to choose the gospel, you will never want to choose the gospel. But when he changes your heart, you do want to choose the gospel, and so you respond out of the great and deep desires of your transformed, regenerated heart. That's Edwards' argument. And again, that fits very well with his emphasis on the joy and affections involved in the Christian life. Here's just a short excerpt from Freedom of the Will. From things which, we, which have been observed, it will follow that it is agreeable to common sense to suppose that the glorified saints have not had their have not their freedom at all diminished in any respect, and that God himself has the highest possible freedom according to the true and proper meaning of the term. So God alone is independent in the use of his free will. And that he is, in the highest possible respect, an agent and active in the exercise of his infinite holiness, though he acts therein in the highest degree necessarily. And his actions of this kind are in the highest, most absolutely perfect manner, virtuous and praiseworthy, and are so for that very reason, because they are most perfectly necessary. So God always acts consistently with his holiness, because that is who he is, and who he, um, that is exactly how he desires to act in the independent exercise of his will. All right, this is just for fun. I threw in a page of Edward's handwriting. It's always amazing to me uh, the amount of literary output that these men were able to produce using nothing more than a feather dipped in ink and writing by candlelight after it got dark, uh, which makes me feel lame for the very little literary output that I have using computers. So, no excuses on your projects, guys. No excuses. All right, on his death. Now, he, of course, Edwards dies suddenly, and uh, that all is part of God's sovereign providence as well. And I think one of the, the reason I include this little quote from Sarah Edwards is it's one thing to preach and teach the sovereignty of God. It's another thing to live it out consistently so that those who know you best rely and trust on that truth even when you're not there anymore. And I think this quote really... Um, I think it brings out the fact that, uh, that Jonathan Edwards' family understood uh, the sovereignty of God and trusted in it even after their dad and husband died very suddenly. So here's Sarah talking to one of her children. Oh, my very dear child, 
What shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands on our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had him, Jonathan, so long. But my God lives and he has my heart. Oh, what a legacy my husband and your father has left us. We are all given to God and there I am and love to be. And so you see the great sadness at losing her husband and yet the great hope in that her perspective is still fixed on a sovereign and good God and not fixed on her circumstances which were painful in the moment. There's a lesson in there for us, too. Um, since I'm sermonizing more today than normal, I might as well just keep doing it. Um, <clears throat> I think the sovereignty of God is one of the greatest doctrines that you can communicate consistently to your people that gives them hope and courage in the midst of trials, even serious trials like losing a loved one. And if you train them well to trust in God's sovereignty when life is good, they will continue to trust God's sovereignty even when life is difficult. And as a pastor, you have a responsibility to convey that truth to your congregation. So I see an example of that in Edward's life and even in his death, the way that his family members responded. Here's Edward's tomb there uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, where he is buried. And then a final picture of Jonathan Edwards. And then it wouldn't, I think it wouldn't be appropriate to end a lecture like this without a quote from John Piper on the legacy of Jonathan Edwards. Piper says this, My own judgment is that from generation to generation, giants like Edwards are needed to inspire us to think about our faith and to guard us from settling superficially on small ideas about a small God. We need Edwards to waken us from our pragmatic stupor of indifference to doctrine and worship and prayer and evangelism and missions and church planting and social action. We need Edwards to show us again the beauty and the power of truth. Edwards does this so well because he is relentlessly God-besotted. That's a great word. That's a a Piper-esque word. And God exalting. He helps us recover truth because he never loses sight of the unspeakable reality of God where truth originates and whom it exists to serve. And so, again, just another wonderful example. Edwards wasn't perfect. We saw that on Tuesday. Even when he made his resolutions, he had many times of failing and ups and downs, living in the reality of the battle between the spirit and the flesh. But at the same time, he does present for us a wonderful model in church history of one who was committed to the glory and honor of Christ and derived his greatest joy and pleasure from pursuing that that honor and glory in everything that he did.